Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this weekly ag weather update brought to you by the Farm Credit Associations of North Carolina and Nutrient Ag Solutions. I'd like to start off first with a discussion about drought. I'm going to cover the long range forecast first, and then I'm going to get into this week, which has two very high impact storm systems that are mostly going to stay away from North South Carolina. So we're going to start here with our latest drought monitor. It just came out last week, and it shows us still a substantial portion of the United States in drought. Now for the West, the months of January and February have been extremely dry. And what's keeping us sustained was how wet things were uh, in December. But we have seen these issues of drought expansion throughout big sections of the West over the last uh, you know, 45 to, to 65 days. I want to talk about that because there's a couple of different things I think we should always look at. We come up here first and go to the change maps. And once we get onto this link, this is what the drought monitor, uh, you know, change has been in the last week. So you can see some areas on the periphery of where there is drought have gotten worse. But then we look back over the last three months and we can see where that drought area has really expanded. Now, the reason why we have to keep looking at this is because I'm concerned going into spring and summer on the extent of this drought area because I'll just kind of paint a pretty simple picture here. Let's imagine that this area, you know, this whole region kind of develops drought over the coming weeks. Now this is just a, a what if, but if it does, what this tends to do is it tends to push the jet stream in a pattern that is something like that. All right, just goes around it. And in that particular case, we tend to have a, a lot of, of very wet weather throughout our spring, summer, uh, and, and even into fall here. And just so you know, when big ridges tend to build right here, tropical systems love to just sneak underneath those. So this would be a setup where we would be looking here over in the East Coast at a very wet go of it this spring and into summer and possibly into fall as well. So that's the first thing we look at here. But the other question I, I just am asking myself is if we just come in here and instead of going to the Maps tab, go over to the Data tab and click on Time Series. I'm not sure if you're aware of, of this great tool, but you can actually click any location in the United States and get a Time Series back from when the drought monitor was started, which is in, in the year 2000. And then you can hover over it and see how much drought you're in by looking uh, you know, right down here into this table. So I want to point out something here. The last time we saw this much of the United States in some stage of drought was in uh, July and August of 2012, and that was the middle of the year. And here we are still in late winter, and we currently have something around you know, 70 to 72 percent of the country in some stage of drought, with more than half of it in those, you know, those four big stages we need to be thinking about here. So what I'm trying to ask myself is, all right, this is the setup. Where is all of this going? And we're going to turn our attention first to what NOAA has just released. So the website I love to use here is cpc.ncep, that's ncep.noaa.gov. And I'll just take it to the top so you can see it. I come down here and I've hovered over the week three, week four outlooks. Now, this is very consistent with the La Nina pattern. Mild across the south, what much colder than average across the north, active Ohio River Valley storm track. Now, you can see that we're here on, on the edge of this. And we're going to look at a couple of different models here to understand if we should expect to see you know, more normal precipitation through the next you know, few weeks. But what I want to come back to is let's just come over here to the drought outlooks. Because the monthly drought outlook suggests, whoops, sorry about that. Let's scroll back down here. There we go. The monthly drought outlook, there it is, suggests that this region is going to see some improvement, but we're seeing expansion north into this area. And the seasonal drought outlook, if I just show you that, shows that much, you know, you get west of about the 95th meridian, we see, uh, you know, we see dry conditions. Now this goes all the way out to the end of May, and I'm, I'm going to call this into question. I'm not quite sure why they've got this area showing in the drought development likely category. Um, I'm, I'm just going to look at it, keep monitoring it, and ask that question because when I look at this, what I see is that you go back through the month of December and into January, you're watching the time here, our La Nina is fading. So you're going to see that the cold waters that were here are starting to pull back and the coldest waters are right now just coming off of South America. We've also seen some cold water in the Gulf of Alaska. We've seen it stretching here off of the Baja at times. But the Atlantic is very, very warm. So you kind of piece all these things together and start to look at what's really controlling the overall flow of the atmosphere. And I just want to show you something. We like to talk a lot about La Nina and El Nino when we come from winter into spring, but I'm going to make a very clear point. La Ninas and El Ninos in spring are not strong predictors. Historically, because we're typically making a transition at this time of year from the ocean patterns we saw in winter to the ocean patterns we're going to see in summer, the correlations are weak. And that's what I'm trying to show you here. 
you can see that Nina region one plus two, and by the way, that's this area right over here. That's where the coldest water still sits, all right? That historically, the correlations, you know, they're, they're staying somewhere in this range from minus 0.2 to plus 0.2 in our area. Now you could say that because of the positive values that we should expect to see a drier March because of this wetter as you get over into the Tennessee Valley, this side of the Appalachian Mountains. We would be concerned about dryness in the Central Plains where there is probably the strongest correlation. That's why I brought that up at the beginning. This could be an area we see drought expansion. But I don't want to put too much confidence in our fading La Nina. We can look at another factor as well, and that is the, the cold water in the Gulf of Alaska. That's called the PDO, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Again, you can see the warmer colors indicating drier risk but wetter on this side of the Appalachian Mountains. Now just keep that in mind, all right? Because this is what all the models are gonna be seeing as a major driver going forward. Now I look at all of that and I start to ask myself a couple questions. All right, I've got a lot of historical data about North Carolina. So for the month of March, I went back and reconstructed a time series, see here, using this great tool called Climate at a Glance. You can Google it and find it. So we did a one month precipitation pattern for North Carolina. Now, just generally speaking, since 1970, we've seen drier um, marches on record. Okay, so that's what that blue trend line shows. But you can see it, it bounces around considerably. And what I'm asking myself is, is this going to be a march where we're near average, above average, or below average? So what's neat about this website is you can come down here and you can rank from the NOAA data uh, the wettest and driest. So for example, since 1970, the wettest uh, march we've had on record was 1980. I could flip this over and show you that the driest was 2006. See that? And the difference, 1.44 inches versus 7.3. Now what I did was I took the top 15 wettest, and I'm gonna to start to do some analysis with that. Whoa, let's shrink that up for you. Now I think that right now, because the La Nina is fading a bit, and I don't see other really strong connections with other bits of a flow of the atmosphere, I'm talking about those teleconnections, I think that the MJO is gonna be a more dominant signal. And this is what we tend to see. When you look at the wettest marches, see I've got them all listed out here, the top 15. The MJO does not like to be in the Indian Ocean. It instead likes to be here in phases, you know, five, six, seven, that area. There tends to be a lot of rising motion over the Pacific as well. And it tends to be drier in uh, South America. So I look at that pattern and say, if the MJO is currently our most dominant teleconnection, and I know that it's right now coming out of the Indian Ocean, leaving it, going here. What is the maritime continent? That's north of Australia. That if it's going to finish February here and then come swinging into phases five, six, and seven into March, that historically that would not be a phase that would suggest that March is going to be dry, despite La Nina, despite the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It would not say that it's going to be a dry month, which means I don't expect drought to expand in very early spring. Okay? Now, how I get that information is we have this. You know, MJO phase five is rare in March, but when it's there, we just tend to get better flow doing like that, coming over ridging in this area. And we put all that together and you start to look at some of the model forecasts, and this is what we see. The European model right now for the long range outlook for the month of March does favor, as you would expect, active weather here. That's consistent, right? But you see how it kind of lets that wetter, those wetter conditions kind of extend into North Carolina. Now this doesn't right now mean that you're gonna have this super wet, soggy, terrible March. What I'm worried about is, is it gonna go into a pattern that's gonna make it super dry, such that we then have to worry about drought later. See where I'm taking this? That's what I'm concerned about. What is interesting about the March outlook is that it does continue to keep things dry here. And this is an area that we've been concerned about drought expansion. It tends to be dry in California, the Southwest, an area that we already have drought. And this is supported not only here from the European model, but also uh, in the data that we get from a model we run in the United States called the CFS V2. Now this is their outlook for the second week of March, March 7th through the 13th. And then this would be the, the third week, March 14th through the 20th, getting us up to the equinox. And again, we, we see that uh, not overly wet, but there will be time periods in March where we bring systems through. In other words, it's not blocked up. There's no indications of it being blocked up in a substantial way that is going to just de deprive us of some of that needed spring precipitation. All right. So uh, here's where we go next. 
let's talk about the pattern. Let's let this reset. In the near term, if we continue to see flow that comes out of the southwest like this, that tends to be an indicator of, of at least having an active pattern. Now, currently today, this deep trough coming into the west is creating a lot of problems. Take a look at this. This is our all hazards weather map for here on Monday, uh, February 21st. And we've got winter storm warnings, winter weather advisories, red flag warnings here. There's flood watches from the from the mid-south here into the Tennessee and Ohio Valley, and it's cold in the west. And we're gonna talk about that cold in a second. Where this is all going is best shown, I think, here in the next week. Uh, this is the WPC total preset for the next seven days. All right, we finally returned some moisture to the west. It has been some places in California, uh, you know, almost 60 days since it's last precipitated here. But it's all going to eject right into this area. Now, what we're going to see is today's severe weather threat is here. Tomorrow, the severe weather threat is here. What about North Carolina, though? Let's see what time things get to our part of the country. High res European. We play this through the day on Monday, getting out there into Tuesday midday, Tuesday uh, evening. What keeps us away from this first system, which races through the midsection of the country, delivering all that rain and snow to the north, is going to be high pressure. Now, the snow that does come on the back side of this is going to hit an area that's currently sitting at less than 10 to 20 percent of normal snowfall this year. So, you're going to have a lot of happy growers out here getting some snow finally, like in South Dakota, over to southern Minnesota and parts of Wisconsin. But that first round kind of misses us. When does it finally try to get here? Well, the front will be elongated by Wednesday, right in through this area. Then we play into Wednesday afternoon and evening. That's our first chance of bringing some scattered showers, maybe a thunderstorm in here. System number two, though, reloads at this point. It was digging through the west. Here it is. It's going to produce possibly a big ice storm from Oklahoma through Arkansas, Missouri, uh, into Illinois and Indiana. But this is the system that tries to get to us by Thursday. And then again on Friday. But what you notice is I just played this out a week. We got a couple of chances for precipitation, but nothing too heavy. And so that's why when we look out there that far, that uh, we, we just see these systems really primarily staying in through this corridor and certainly delivering some snow to the north. In fact, let's go take a look at that. This is the total snowfall through the next five days. So bringing in some snow to some regions, regions that really need it in through here, plus put a little bit more into the Rocky Mountains. But that ice storm is one of the big things I'm worried about. Look at this. As we play forward, this is the one that's coming out Tuesday, Wednesday. And they're going to see this one here, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But I'm not talking much about what's going on in the Carolinas because this is your precip. We zoom in here and add it up. This is through Tuesday, getting into Wednesday, out to Thursday. So let's just stop it here. By Thursday at noon, best chances of, of rain this early system this week is, is west and it's less than an inch overall heavy to be right over the top of the Appalachian Mountains on the border with you in Tennessee then we see the second round remember that one comes through Friday Saturday so it tries to push a little more moisture in there but not much and even if I let this play on out through the weekend I have a chance at some weekend precipitation that comes through but overall this next week you know we're looking at amounts generally less than an inch in a lot of places picking up between a quarter uh, and three quarters of an inch of rainfall so that, that's that's what I mean that's normal we're not we're not pushing the limits of dry or wet uh, we're sitting there right on our averages the pattern once we go into week two looks something like this let me just draw this out for you the ridge is in the Gulf of Alaska there's a weak trough coming in here but the flow is generally coming around like that so what this tells me is if we get flow coming in this direction that's convergent flow it's a bit drier and it also means we're going to see some colder weather so when we look out there to week two notice we have a bit of a drier bias in that same area as the atmosphere kind of goes into a bit of a reset mode but it is going to deliver the cold air you ready for this this is monday's highs getting into tuesday oh we're going to have warmth early this week there's tuesday going into wednesday but look at how deep the Arctic blast is behind this. When does it get to us? Well, enjoy this all week long. 70s cracking 80 possibly because by Thursday into Friday, here comes Saturday, Sunday. Our weekend's going to be cold. So you got a really warm week ahead, followed by some pretty cold air coming in after that. Let's go take a look at that day 5 through 10 time period. That's when the coldest air has its greatest extent. But since we're not really linked up with, you know, just a deep disturbance here in the polar vortex. I'll set that. There we go. This polar vortex is strong. It's not disturbed uh, at all. We get out there past this, you know, next, uh, we get out there past midweek next week, and the pattern goes mild again. So that's how things are kind of shaping up for us. And I just wanted to assess how far away from average we're going to be. And what you saw here was that 
this doesn't look like one of those marches that's going to show up as being extreme. And that's good news. Where it is changing quite a bit, and I'll finish with this, is South America. Because the MJO, which we talked about earlier, is going to phase five, that tends to be a, a, a part of the MJO pattern that suppresses the monsoon. So this is where we're expecting drier conditions over the next 15 days. Now, if you remember, we've talked a lot about this. It had been quite wet in Brazil's northern growing areas for most of this growing season. They're actively trying to harvest soybeans and plant the safrina corn crop, and this drier weather is going to help them finish. Where it's now going over wet, Argentina, into southern Brazil, down here. You look at this overall and say, as long as this doesn't persist, this is a very favorable precipitation pattern for South America. It's not going to undo the damage of the drought early, but it's going to prevent the extension of that drought and the problems from it down here in Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and southern Brazil. Now, if the rains do not return into this area in the next, um, you know, let's call it in the next two weeks after that, then we're going to have to have a conversation about drought expanding in the north. And I'm going to make one final statement about this. Remember that business we talked about with the line, or excuse me, with... Um, the MJO. This is a phase right here that Brazil, northern Brazil, worries about. It typically takes about six weeks for the MJO to come all the way around. And if it does that, if it just comes all the way around, this would time up the return to MJO phase five at a critical time period in northern Brazil for when the crop is going in. This would be the safrina corn crop is going through pollination uh, and into grain fill, like that time period. And we'd look at a map and look just like this. And that would indicate the early shutdown of the monsoon. And there'd be a lot of concern about the quality of the crop there. So I know we had a lot to cover today, uh, but a little bit of extended video. But I appreciate your time. And we'll talk to you again next Monday. Thanks.